Well, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and thank you so much for joining me today on the Friday Masterclass, where today we're talking about the Premiere Pro Timeline Basics. And uh, this is sort of a two in this huge sort of getting started with Premiere series that we began uh, a couple of months ago. Today, we're going to dive deep into just basic editing, uh, using some of the editing tools, focusing in on the source monitor, and all the little nuances and things that unless you were actively trying to stumble upon them and find them, there's all these little things in the source monitor, little right-click menus, hamburger menus, drag and drop options that you have that really can improve and enhance the editing experience, even if you're brand new to editing. So this is not the advanced part. This is really stuff that anybody and everybody should know just to get a better experience when working inside of Premiere Pro. Um, next week, of course, we're, we're then going to visit the more advanced techniques and take things a step further. But today you're gonna get a good, a good taste of the fundamentals and how the tools work uh, in conjunction with the timeline and building up your sequences. So as always, we're coming to you live across YouTube, uh, Behance, uh, Facebook, and today Twitter as well. So thank you so much for joining. Hello to our friends from No Film School. Always great to see all of you. Of course, we have our live chats going now. Uh, I have them in front of me. I'll be able to see all of your chats. If you are, um, oh, that's not what I wanted. If you are um, wanting to get your uh, questions in front of me, this is the chat that uh, I recommend logging into. Of course, if you're on No Film School, I'm following yours over here as well. So no worries there. But for everybody else, b.net slash Adobe Live. Those are gonna put the comments right in front of me. As always, a couple of quick uh, hellos and shouts to everybody watching. We've got Shlomi tuning in today. Hello, a lady in the life, Tate, Lino Gomez, Pete Breen, young Kenny J, good vibes. <laughs> nice to see you. Reverb Mike, Cody Bear, Oliver Andrews, Mustafa, Theo Theo. What's up, Katrina? Caught the end of your stream uh, with Jordan just then. That was awesome. Uh, do you actually have Patreon? I, did, I didn't miss the beginning. I loved, I loved what you created in any case. Julie Benson, hey, how are you? So nice to see you. Uh, Basic Materials Project, Padawan Collector, Lori Andini, nice to see you as well. And Julie is saying, I so appreciate these videos and the way you teach, Jason. I don't feel talked down to, which is nice. Oh, that's so very nice. And yeah, of course, you know, you get to see me. <laughs> you know, part of my style is you get to see it just as it is. So, you know, talking down, no. Uh, very open to screwing up and making mistakes right here. These things happen, you know, that's how it is. So we're, we're, we're going through it together. But yes, of course, it's a, it's a welcome safe space. And this is for anybody who's starting in Premiere. And again, if you've already been doing this for a long time, this may be a repeat for you. So I wouldn't tell you not to tune in, but if you're like, I already know what the Ripple tool does, well, you know, keep it on in the background. It helps with the algorithm. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and uh, dive in. Switch over my screen here. And we're going to get started. All right, just doing it. Hello, how are you? Okay. So once again, we're uh, revisiting some footage, footage from the past, maybe a combination of uh, footage from various things shot over the years. And we're going to start with, again, kind of focusing in on source monitor. Now, you've already seen a bunch of things about how to begin projects, how to create sequences, how to start a sequence. Um, from a clip. We've kind of talked a lot about the interface and preferences. We're going to be revisiting some of that. Last time we had our friend Dan from Red, again, talking about custom sequence creation and all that stuff. This is really going to get into all the little nuances of all the things inside source and program and a lot of the different buttons. And again, some of these menu options, which you probably know they exist, but you didn't know where to find them. That's what we're going to look at today. So when you begin an edit, as with all the things we've talked about over these last couple of months, there's so many ways to do the same operation, okay? So typically what I'll do is once I import all of my footage, um, you know, I, again, I, I typically will view in either, I, I said, sometimes I'll actually use the list view because I just want kind of the details, the data, the length, you know, a mixture of 4K and 1080p here. Sometimes I'll go into icon view. We're gonna save free form until the end because this is where we're going to essentially storyboard once we've set in and out points and done some other work up front. But when I'm you know, just wanting to sort of take a look at all the clips and see what's in them to find the best selections, the best pieces of those clips, to do that, we just double click and that brings us right into the source monitor, okay? Now, on the surface, the source, not too dissimilar from the program monitor, right? The idea here being that this is where you're going to review the clip in question. 
potentially maybe use a marker to mark a particular piece that you like. Maybe you're not going to do your final in and outs here. Maybe you're going to do multiple selections from a single clip here. Now, we can only bring in one in and out marked selection at a time, but this is where you could use things like markers. We're going to go more into markers next week. I, I consider that a slightly more advanced thing. You still have the ability, however, to add, you can see it right above my head there, add markers uh, to a clip from within the source monitor. So you can hit shortcut key M if you're on the US keyboard here. In this case, if I just tap it, you can see that it automatically drops a marker in there. And there's a number of reasons why you might do this. Again, if you have a longer clip and maybe you have three, you know, talking head sections that you want to use, you could mark each of those with a marker just like this. All right. And again, taking that a step further, if you double click on those markers, you can, you know, change the name, you can add comments, you can change the marker color. You have, you have some flexibility here with um, how you apply and work with those markers. We're going to come back to that. The main things are reviewing your content, setting it in and out points, and then beginning maybe creating that sequence or timeline. So as mentioned, you can, of course, scrub through all of this with the mouse. Now, something that we're going to revisit a lot, I've talked about it already. I don't like to talk about shortcut keys too much on these streams because, again, I'm using the US keyboard and the US version. And your keyboard shortcuts will change depending upon the keyboard that you're using. There's, there's no there's no general way. I mean, some things are general, but you can translate some of these. So I, I try and give you a couple of keyboard shortcuts here and there that are easily translatable based on different keyboards across the, you know, across the various regions. So an alternative to drag and scrubbing the timeline is to use the JKL keys on your keyboard. OK, so in this case, JKL, they're all adjacent uh, here. And if I hit L, that's going to play forward. If I hit K, it's going to stop or pause. And if I hit J, it will reverse. And if you double tap L, it'll go double speed. Double tap J, it'll go double speed reverse. Triple tap, triple tap, you get the idea. I don't use a lot of keyboard shortcuts. You know this. My brain also only allows me to retain about 17 total, apparently. <laughs> That's across all Adobe applications, luckily. We use a lot of the same keyboard shortcuts across multiple apps. So uh, I have some free space in there. Got to have a little bit of a buffer, you know. Um, but this is really a very ideal way, particularly if you're just trying to scrub through to find, you know, like I did, I'm doing all these various rack focuses. So I knew the one that I wanted, which was this last one right here. All right. So I find that and I can use again a common shortcut I and O to set my endpoint. Wait until it goes right to the sharpest point on this glide button. O for out. And now I have my in and out section. Now, this little, uh, these little three vertical bars that you see here, this is what we call the grip. So what this allows you to do is if I wanted to say, take this section, which is of a particular duration. In this case, it looks like it's a second and 11 frames. And I wanted to apply this to a different section. I want the same duration, but I just want to use a different piece of this. I can simply click and drag that little grip handle and I have the same duration in and out, but now I'm just leveraging a different section um, of the edit here. Okay. Pretty common, something I do a lot, you know, again, particularly if I'm doing something like this where I'm trying to get a particular shot, I do it multiple times sometimes and I know exactly how the duration needs to be. I can do something like that. Once you do that, of course, you also have the ability here to drag those handles to make it longer or shorter. Okay, these may seem like really obvious things, but if you're new to this, maybe it's not. You also, in lieu of using any shortcuts, and I'm all for that, you also have the buttons themselves, mark in and mark out. Something else you also have here, go to in, and go to out. So this is sometimes useful again if you're kind of you know scrubbing through and you want oh what was that in point? Oh it's there. What's the out point of that? Oh it's there. So this is just a really easy way visually to see the start. And again, I actually wanted it starting. Does that the ever get in focus? No, it's way too far away. Okay, so that's going to be it. Yeah. So rogue is in focus. Glide button is in focus. Right. So this is kind of a good way to verify those things. Now your buttons may look a little. <laughs> Sounds like a personal thing. Your buttons may look a little bit different than mine. That's because we have this customizable button editor in the source monitor, just like the customizable button editor that I showed you in the program monitor. 
So if you want to add or subtract different buttons in there, this is where you do that. And once again, now we're not going to add any here. I don't really need any in particular. We might add some to the program monitor in just a little bit. But this is where you can simply say, oh, okay, I need, I need some additional buttons in here. Maybe I want to be able to uh, have my toggle proxy button down here. Or maybe I want, if I'm previewing, you know, uh, uh, VR content for whatever reason, maybe I want the loop playback. This is actually one that I would definitely use in the source monitor. You just drag it right down, just like that. Um, and then I have other buttons here, which I don't. I don't often use so, but they're here by default, like insert and overwrite and export frame. This one is actually one of my most favorite and extremely useful. A lot of times people are like, oh, I would love to just grab a snap of that frame or something like that. Click on export frame. You have a couple of options here. TIFF, Targa, Ping, OpenEXR, JPEG, and DPX. Tell it where you want it to go. You can import it back into the project. Click OK and you're done, all right? And I believe, I don't, I don't believe this has changed. These are creating 8-bit TIFFs if you're doing TIFF export. Despite the fact that we are working in a 32-bit float container here in the timeline, in the sequence, always um, the exports of the images here, I believe, uh, regardless of what the video is. So if the video, the video could be, you know, ProRes 422HQ or 444, whatever, greater than 8-bit, I believe the TIFF export is still 8-bit. Kevin's in here. Kevin, not from uh, QE. You can you can keep me honest on that. But uh, I believe that's the case. Mick Garrison, I want Jason to be my age, but people with grayish hair seem to be getting younger and younger. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I am not young, but thanks. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm watching you now from Baghdad, Iraq. Keep it up, brother. You are crave. Oh, thank you very much. Very kind. Young Kenny J from Ghana, great to see you. Oh, what a wonderful international audience as always. Okay, uh, Misty Iwatsu, what are the general differences in formats? Well, that's a very, very big question, Misty. Um, just in terms of bit depth, the best way to, to explain it that I think almost anybody can understand is think of bit depth similar to working with JPEGs or raw image files, right? So if you're working with 8-bit video, typically also known as 420, uh, something that you would have shot on your previous generation iPhones um, or just previous mobile or things like older school DSLRs. Many of them now do 10-bit or greater. 8-bit is going to be like your JPEG, essentially. Um, this doesn't mean it can't look good. It could be a high bit rate MP4 or H.264 or H.265 codec that they're using. It is a compressed format. Um, but 8-bit specifically is just going to give you, you have less color latitude specifically for grading and exposure. So if you shoot something overexposed in an 8-bit format, you bring it into Premiere, you bring it into Resolve, bring it anywhere. If your sky is blown out or your shadows are completely crushed black, there's no restoring them. You, you might be able to, to bring back a little bit by messing about with contrast and perhaps adjusting black level, white level, a little, maybe. But essentially what was lost at the sensor in an 8-bit format is gone. If you shoot greater than 8-bit, 10-bit, 12-bit, 14, etc., now, much like raw image files, this gives you all that additional data. So like I've been you know, showing a lot of footage from the iPhone 13 uh, Pro Max shot in 4K HDR ProRes, right? This is a 10-bit 422. I showed you some footage. It's totally blown out. I grab the exposure slider and suddenly we're seeing sky, we're seeing definition, we're seeing all these things that we didn't see originally. That's the major difference, okay? So you know, most of your consumer DSLR mirrorless cameras are gonna shoot 8-bit. Some of the newer ones will now do 10. Um, some of them, you could just go HDMI out and feed a recorder that will capture in 10-bit. Now again, sometimes it's still sending 8-bit through the HDMI, so there's some limitations there. But that's the basic answer. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. What happens in the shadows? I just happened to re-binge season two of what we do in the shadows over the last two days. Reverb mic. Yeah, Kevin, I'm 98.65% I'm sure it is 8-bit and has been for some time. And this has been a kind of point of contention for me because if I'm doing TIFF exports, I want 10 or I want 10 or 4 I want greater than 8 because I typically bring them into Photoshop to make thumbnails out of them. <laughs> so, 
But if you could verify, that would be awesome. Okay. So in point, out point, buttons, uh, go to in, go to out, inserting, all those things. All right. Now, a couple things to keep in mind, and we're going to come back to this. Once you do this, now, you know, typically what I will then do is go to another piece of footage and come in here and again, kind of verify what's going on in there. You can see I already used a marker here. I've, I did this actually in Prelude when I was reviewing some of this footage some time ago. So I can set my in and outs here, all right? And again, I just kind of keep going through all this stuff to find, you know, the best parts of the shots that I want. Now, one of the nice things that we have inside the source monitor is if I want to re, <laughs> I almost said re-review, if I want to review a clip that I've already viewed in the source monitor, if I come up to this little hamburger menu up at the top here, this will now allow me to pull in or re-pull in, huh? This will allow me to revisit footage that I've already viewed inside the source monitor. Just a nice little thing, not something you're always going to do. But, you know, if I was like, oh, I think this clip, oh, no, that's not that one. Let's see, maybe this one. Sure. Um, you know, I can revisit this. Oh, I forgot to set my in and out points here. By the way, that is my old school Galaxian, which you can't see. It's sitting on top of the speaker over here. Um, I never finished this video. This is the whole thing about technology in 1981. That's when these little uh, <laughs> 1 16th scale video game machines came out. I shot this documentary. I never finished it. Okay. So, um, Reverb Mike is saying, I would like to go raw, not ready yet. S-Log is working for now. Oh, yes. Yeah. And that's that's for another day. I think we were talking a little bit about S-Log last week too, right? Um, when we were uh, meeting with Dan. Okay. So, one of the other essential things inside of the source monitor here is that you also have different ways to view your video content. You have, you have three. You have composite, audio, and alpha. So sometimes what I like to do, now this is an ex this is an exception because this is the source footage without the secondary audio. So you can see I'm wearing a mic in this shot. This was um, this is from 2016 when we were in, uh, we did a, sh uh, a whole thing in um, in Tokyo and this was after Max, where there was this brief viral moment where I began singing this song, gathered the crowd, shouted aloud, creative cloud. My hands are blocking there. There it is. <laughs> uh, so they had shirts made up. And this was actually like on a billboard in Shibuya somewhere. It was pretty, it was pretty cool. The team surprised me with that. In any case, um, sometimes I don't want to set my in and out points just by video, particularly if there's like a lot of messing around where I'm not talking, right? So the talent, I'm waiting for them to get the shot. Maybe I do multiple takes. So if I go to the wrench settings menu, I can change from viewing composite video to viewing via audio waveform. And what that this allows me to then do is see, now again, this audio is, it's a bit quieter because it's not, uh, it's, well, I'm just far away. So it's the, it's the audio directly captured from the camera, but you can see, you know, where they say action over here okay. or okay, whatever, and silence. And then I begin talking right here. So it's just another way to view the, you know, edit via the waveform versus the visual. Now, this is particularly useful if you're doing music editing, right? If you're kind of looking for a break or a drop or looking for the beat much easier to see in waveform in a, in a large waveform display. And of course you can go full screen on this. By the way, that shortcut, as I've shown many times on the US keyboard, that's the tilde key. All right. Another sort of handy, convenient way uh, to bring your content in. All right. Now, once that content is in, then you can decide how do I want to actually import that content? And I'm just making sure I actually made myself notes so I don't forget. Now, you got a couple different things you can do. First, you can drag, of course, directly from the source monitor. And you can do this in three different, four different ways. <laughs> There's actually five ways to import content from the source monitor. So again, we give you so many options. What's the best way to do it? I don't know, whatever you like to do. I can almost tell you, most people probably don't do it the way I do it most of the time, because I, I don't know, I'm just like quick and dirty old school, right? So if you, only, if you want the whole video as it is, I can just click from the middle of the source monitor 
I can drag this down into this existing timeline right here if I so desire. All right, place it at the end right there. And uh, here's what we just dragged in. Uh, what's going on with those expressions I'm making there? All right, drag it in like that. That's one way. Now, what if I only wanted the audio portion of this selection, right? We were making in and out points. Maybe I just want my voiceover because I'm going to do a bunch of B-roll in the background. Well, I can also just take the audio. Now, you do, of course, have the ability, once you have the audio and video in the timeline, if I say only wanted the audio, but I dragged it in this way, how do I do that? Well, if I select the clip, all right, down in the timeline here, I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to choose unlink, okay? This now gives me independent control over the audio and video of that clip. Now, this is particularly useful if a um, couple of reasons. One, you might be shooting video where maybe there was a glitch, maybe something happened while you were filming, maybe you're doing something in, in variable frame rate or whatnot, and there's a there's a, a, a timing difference between the audio and the visual. It's out of sync. Usually this is something like, you know, three to five, three to seven frames. So what this would allow me to do, if that were the case, it's not, but if it were, that would mean, you know, I'll have to figure out what it is. Let's say it's three frames. So I'm zoomed in to frame level here. You can see I'm moving at the frame level, all right, with my cursor, I'm, I'm using my arrow keys. I could now drag the audio precisely three frames ahead. Okay, we're pretending here. And then if that is now in sync, I can reselect them, relink them, okay? And this is now going to tell me on the clip that there's a three frame difference, right? And in this case, I've pushed the audio three frames ahead, okay? So this this happens. Um, it, I just had a, uh, someone ask me about this. They were doing some recordings in ScreenFlow, which I love, by the way, ScreenFlow, same, I think they're the same company that makes Wirecast, which is what we use for our um, simulcasting here for live streams. Great tool. For whatever reason, they recorded something on their desktop, USB mic, and it was out of sync. So they brought it into Premiere and like, I don't know, it's consistent, but it's out. Unlink, move the clips, relink. Now you can edit easily, okay? So that's one way to do it. You can also, however, we're talking about just bringing in audio, you'll notice that you have these icons in the source monitor, drag video only, drag audio only. So I can simply take the audio, and drag it down here. And now the audio clip is by itself. And I could come in here and say audio gain. All right, and let's normalize this to say minus three. Again, this is the camera audio. It's outside, super noisy. So this is not gonna be particularly audibly beautiful, but just so you can hear it a little better. Oh, and I have to unmute, that helps too. I'm Jason Levine, and today Jason's place is in Tokyo. Okay, bring just the audio in, right? You can bring just the video in. Now, I don't know why you would do that unless I'm talking elsewhere because that would be weird, but I can just bring the video portion of this in, all right? The other thing we can do is we can use, of course, those buttons that I never use. <laughs> you know what? I think I don't use these buttons for two reasons. One, because I've never used them, principle. <laughs> it's just how it is. I've been editing in Premiere for 22 years. I just don't, I don't like the icons, they bother me, so I've never used these. Also, there's a better way to insert or overwrite, all right? Now, what I do like about the UI of these buttons is that it tells you it's going to insert, think of your clip as this, this square with the, with the arrow pointing down, insert between or overwrite over top of, right? Even better though, we can use drop zones. And I showed this, I think, in one of the first streams in this series where I can simply drag from the source monitor to the program monitor. And now I have these awesome drop zones that tell me exactly what I'm doing with my footage based on the position of my cursor and where it is in relation to a clip. So I can, if I choose this, it's going to insert before the first clip. I can replace, I can overwrite, I can insert after, I can just do a straight insert, or I can overlay over top of. I know I've shown this before, people forget about it. We always have new viewers, so I love showing this. This is one of the best darn pieces of UX UI I think we've ever done in this app. I just love this. So if I wanna just do, again, a straight insert before, this is gonna kick off my video, right? 
just like that. Drag it in. There's my thing again. I've got it muted, so we don't need to worry about that. Okay. Same thing if I wanted to say, you know, let's do insert it after. So you can see it did just that. It placed it after this first clip, right? And essentially cut that little Coleco clip in half there to insert my piece. All right. I just love that because it's just, it just tells me what I want to know. You know, insert over. It's very easy to get confused by those things. Maybe you don't get confused by them. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. This just, this just makes sense to me. Overlay. Yes. Oh, I want it to be over top of while, you know, so that'll, that'll get priority, right? Makes sense. Love this. So this is just a really easy way to drag that content into a timeline. Now, once you've done your in and out points, once you've done all your settings and stuff here, let's do another one on this one up here. Um, something like that, right about there. Okay. Now I can create that sequence, build that sequence and start dragging stuff in. So as shown before, um, if you want to make that new timeline, again, multiple ways to do it. We can go down to the new item icon and, and choose new sequence. We can go up to the file new sequence. We can do file new sequence from clip or my favorite, easiest, fastest, use this 100% of the time, right click new sequence from clip. Okay. Now the benefits of doing that with this is that it's going to set the sequence based on the attributes of that first clip. Now I say that because again, this is why list view can be particularly useful. I've got two clips in here, or it looks like, no, sorry, just one clip. It's a sequence that happens to be 4k. The rest of my media is 1080. So if I were to take this clip and drag it in to the timeline, okay, that clip now, of course, is oversized, right? So this is where we could instead say set to frame size so that it now conforms um, to 1080p instead of 2160p, right? And by using set to frame size, it's going to maintain the quality, which means that we can pan and scan and leverage the benefit of 4K in a 1080 timeline because you'll see by using set to frame size, it just scales down the original footage by 50% or whatever, whatever percentage, you know, based on whatever that first clip is. Okay. So this is great. This is awesome. This gives us a lot of flexibility. And you know that if you just right click new sequence from clip, it's going to have all the correct attributes. Okay. Now, someone brought this up last time. And I think it's worth mentioning here since we're talking about timeline stuff. Uh, what if you need to change sequence attributes after the fact? Well, you can do that as well by selecting your sequence here, going up to the sequence menu, sequence settings. Okay. And then this is where we can, you know, if we need to adjust the editing mode, if we need to adjust the time base, we need to adjust the frame. Maybe we actually want to do this in 4k. Maybe we want to do this in 8k, right? As we saw last week or two weeks ago with Dan from red. It's, it's not something outside of the scope of the modern cinematographer video editor to do a lot of stuff in 8k. Export in four, but do your master in eight, if, you know, whatever, or edit in four, but do what I just showed you. Use 8k inside of a 4k timeline and take advantage of all the pan and scanning options that you have there. This is, you can also change your color space here. Again, this is new as of the last uh, six months or so. The only thing that you can't change inside the sequence menu, and people have complained about this, and I don't exactly know the, the, the exact reasoning for why, but it makes sense, is you can't change the master output of your audio. So if you begin a sequence, and again, I did it from a clip that was a stereo clip, it's a stereo sequence, two channels output, that's it. I can have multi-channel tracks so I could have individual tracks in my sequence that have six channel audio, eight channel audio, and then I still have routing capabilities, but the master remains two channel. That cannot be changed. Curiously, and by the way, Kev, if you're there, answer, answer me this. Riddle me this, because 
<laughs> I mean, I'm not ranting here. I'm just trying to get a little clarity. We allow you to change the sample rate somehow, which is don't ever do that. Don't do that if you're currently working in something. Here's why. Because when you change the sample rate, in this case, you'd only do one of three things. Maybe you'd go to 44.1. Highly doubtful. If there's anybody in any chat who's editing video with 44.1 as the, as the sample rate, tell me. T and tell me why. I don't know anybody who does that. It's the 44.1 is the CD standard. 48 is the video standard. So it would make no sense to do it in 44.1. 96 is what you would ultimately go to. The problem is, and this is one of these nerd things I'm giving you now, you're probably going, I see ranting. Because I don't know where else you're going to find this. Maybe you will. Probably not. Do not change sample rate in a project that you're working in, or if you continue, if you're doing other things that don't use that sample rate. Because what happens is, especially if you're using a pro sound card, sound device, it's going to lose internal sync. You have to usually typically manually change the sample rate uh, of your sound device. So I don't know why we dynamically allow you to change that. That, that, sh that should be grayed out because that's, that's pretty dangerous. Now, if you're using just like an internal sound card, let's just say you're using your onboard sound on a laptop. Well, it will automatically switch. You're just opening yourself up for potential problems. Also, as we will cover next week in the, in the advanced editing uh, class, if you were to say edit at sample level, which we call audio units in Premiere, and you've already done some sample level editing in 48K and now you convert it to 96K, you are very likely going to have some weird potential sync issues. Just don't change this. That's I'm not one for a lot of absolutes ever. I just want to be open and free, man. Don't change your sample rate midstream ever. Don't do that. You're just asking for problems. And then as far as format milliseconds, this doesn't matter. Don't also, don't ever put it in audio samples unless you like counting to 48,000 because what that's going to display is 48,000 samples per second. So again, it's a ni it's nice. It should be there. You do want sample level. We have it in audition that, that makes it a pro audio tool, but again, tell, tell me why, all right, why you would use audio samples, <laughs> please share. Yes, Kevin's, I always use it in 48K. Of course, yes. Again, you'd only, you would only change it to 96 or something else at the start if your source was captured in 96 or maybe, you know, for like a Hollywood film or something like that, they have orchestra record, right? There's, there's, there's orchestra, there's underscore, there's music, there's elements, which most likely were captured at 24 bit 96 K. So yes, have a 96 K timeline makes sense. A 96 K project. You won't likely deliver it 96 K unless you're doing like a, you know, a Blu-ray export or something like that. Generally, 90% of the time, 99% of the time, you're going to export it at 48K stereo or maybe 48K 5.1. Okay. All right. And then we have the video preview stuff. Again, that's not, you can change that, but that's not relevant to, what, to the source monitor stuff we're talking about here. Okay. Don't go changing. Thank you, Reverb Mike. Here all week. That was my parents' song in the 70s. I love you just the way you are. <laughs> Karen Brisa, how are you? Okay. Shlomi is asking, hi, Jason. Question about new imports and exports. Why did Adobe disable the proxy button? Now to create a proxy, I need to import the material and then make a proxy and not at the time of project open. Um, I, I, as you can see um, on this particular system, I've not yet updated this, this is this is an older system. So on the M1 system that I use, I've got it updated with the new import export. That's what Shlomi is uh, referring to. Um, yeah, they've made some changes there. Here's the thing. If you're wanting to do the proxy creation, and I haven't looked at the latest updates, so I'm not, I don't remember them removing the proxy button. Perhaps they did. Um, you can still do it the traditional way. You can also still, if you want to bring media into a project, you can do the ingest here. So this is for those of you who are just tuning in, we're talking about making proxies upon importing ingesting of footage. So you can still bring content in. And if you enable ingest here, okay, and then click on the little wrench menu and then tell it, how do you want to ingest? Okay, well, I want to 
copy and create, or just maybe create proxies. And what do I what do I want to do? I want to do a ProRes LT with a logo, and here's where I want it to go. You can still do that from the media browser. All right, that's actually how I tend to do it in general, because I'm finding nowadays that just because I seem to have footage in lots of different places, I don't bring in massive amounts of footage generally at one time because there's usually smaller bits of footage in different folders in different places. So I like to do it via the media browser, but that's that's just a suggestion. I'll look into that and see why. Um, you know, that's we're always changing and kind of expanding that. So um, it's very possible that we may see some other updates and things there. Okay, so now let's go ahead and drag some more of this content into our timeline. All right. And uh, I'm just looking for the ones where we did in and outs. Funny, as I'm saying that, I'm like, why am I getting hungry? Yeah. In and out burger. Another random thought as I'm dragging, by the way, you can see I'm just now, before we get into trimming and stuff, bear with me, I'm just dragging stuff in here. Um, I had another Apple cable fry on me. So the lightning cables, I always have one connected to my machine just to charge whatever devices in front of me. I always use non-Apple third-party braided cables, right? Classic, you know, uh, here's here's like one type that I you can see it's blue, super, you know, really nice, like 10 bucks, whatever, um, reliable. I've had so many of these Apple cables literally like fry, catch fire, sometimes inside the device. Well, this cable's been in the iMac, periodically plugged into a phone or an iPad every other day. No issue, no problem. The other day, I go to pick up my phone, which had been plugged in all day, and the phone was dead. So it hadn't been charging all day. I take the cable out, and I immediately hear this like little spark. No joke, little bit of smoke. I threw it out. Unfortunately, I have a picture of it. It burned up. It just fried right inside of the device. That's like the sixth time that happened. It wasn't frayed. It wasn't ripped. It wasn't torn. Just decided to die. So... Oh, those cables. That was like the only one I still had. And that was the universe going, don't use those. They're just, they're not great. What in the world? Misty Iwatsu, as soon as we have that, uh, the Matrix, done deal. <laughs> you may be the first candidate, all right? Yes. Oh, and Kevin's saying yes, make sure source patching is enabled. Okay. That was everyone's song in the 70s, Mick Garrison. Very good. Okay. All right, so now we've got some clips in the timeline. Let's talk about tools. So again, your UI may look a little bit different than mine. You can see that I have the tools panel conveniently located here. Now, first thing in default, of course, is the selection tool shortcut key V. This is the most common. This is what, uh, what we use in almost every Adobe app, I believe. Um, it functions the same. You can pick stuff up with this tool, right? Pick it up, drag it around. You can trim the edges and you'll see that as I hover over the edges of a clip, you see I'm trimming the, the end of this clip or I can drag it back in. We're just clicking and dragging. Now, what is unique about this type of trim is that you'll see it's doing just that. It's just trimming the beginning or the end relative to where it is in the timeline, but it doesn't change position, right? So. In something like this, where let's just pretend that I'm telling some kind of a story here. If I were to do that, right, and trim these clips up, I'm leaving holes. And typically that's not what you want, right? Typically what I'm doing is I'm looking at this and going, okay, this should then cut to some other part of this scene here, make this a little bit shorter. I generally want to do what's known as a ripple edit. Now. If we go down into our tools here, by the way, we're going to skip track, select forward, skip down to the second batch of tools here where there are no fewer than four. Let's start with the ripple edit tool. Now, once again, this is one of the few keyboard shortcuts that I use. Actually, I have a modifier set up so that when I'm on the uh, standard uh, move trim here, if I hold down the command key on Mac, control on Windows, now you see the icon changes to yellow, okay? And that turns it into the ripple edit tool. And when you ripple edit, instead of leaving those holes, right? So now I say, okay, I want this to end here. And I'm looking at the little blinking, I don't know if you can see the little blinking LCD on the screen there. 
right after that blink goes away, four seconds, two frames, that's the end of that clip. When I let go, you'll see that everything ripples to the left, okay? So it keeps, this is also if you're coming from like Rush or um, even I think Final Cut 10, since 10s, I mean, I don't know what version they're on now, but since Final Cut, it's like a magnetic timeline essentially. So there's never any gaps, okay? So generally, for most of the things that I edit, that's usually what I'm doing, sort of a gapless edit, you know, uh, I'm wanting everything to constantly just ripple to the left or right accordingly. And of course it works both ways. So again, maybe here, got a little too much rack going on. I want it to start right about there. Zooming in so you can see. Again, I'm in that tool already. I can just drag the in, the edge of this to the cursor there. And it's going, now it's, again, it's gonna snap because I'm removing frames, it's gonna snap it back to the left, but now that's where I want it. It's exact, that's the starting point where I wanted it to be, all right? By the way, I, you know, as, as I was saying last week with Dan, how tiresome, you know, rack focusing and shooting with super shallow depth of field is, but this is just one of my favorite. This again was this documentary that I never finished, but this was, um, this was the Canon 7D. This was when I was still shooting Canon. And I believe this was either, this could have been the 50 mil F12 or, or this could have been, was maybe this is the, oh, I'm forgetting now. I just forgot. Is it the 18 to 135 or 30 or 18 to 105? What the heck was that lens? It was my absolute favorite Canon lens. Anyway, I just love it. And I love, I love how you can see like the clarity and depth of the, uh, the reflection of the joystick, you know, like little geeky things. As you, you know, you can see the rack nice and slow as I go frame by frame. Again, that's editing takes a long time for me because I get caught in a shot like this. I'm like, oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, never seen bokeh before, you know, <laughs> let's get lost in it. All right. So that's the ripple tool. All right. And again, if you're in the ripple edit, it just, it just works. It does what you want. I love it. It's, you know, 90% of what I'm using most of the time when I'm editing. Now, there's also the case where you might want to do what's known as a roll edit. And you can do this inside of the trim editor. So that's where you just have a better idea of the last frame of the previous clip and the start frame of the next clip. Now I'm going to switch to that tool. Okay. By the way, you can also just right click on an edit point or double click to get to where I'm going to show you. Let's go to the rolling edit tool here. All right. Take a look at what that icon looks like. All right. And if I double click on this edit point, now we're in this, in this trim editor here. Now, anybody who's coming or came from an old school assembly style analog editing world, or even in the early digital, you know, like digital videotape world, this is probably going to feel and look very familiar. In fact, when I started with Premiere, again, Kevin, remind me here, I don't, did we have, did we have a rolling edit? Like a trim window? I can't remember if we did in, the, like I'm talking CS1. I don't know if we did, I can't, it's so hard to remember. I think we didn't, because I can't, I, I think I was looking for this. I'm like, where's the assembly style editing tool? A, 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 a rolling edit. Anyway, what this allows you to do, again, you have a couple different ways to do it. So if you hover your cursor over the center point of these clips here, all right, what you can do is you can drag, right, frame by frame, and it'll tell you when you hit the edge. I don't know if you're seeing there in the window at the bottom. I can't, I can't quite do it while I'm dragging this. There's a little tooltip that's popping up there and it's saying trim media limit reached on video one because we're at the edge. So this is going to allow you to adjust visually the edge of that edit, all right? Or you can trim forward with some preset buttons right here by one frame or five frames, okay? You can also apply default transitions at the edit. We're gonna talk more about that next week, but this is usually, it's like a cross dissolve or trim backward, all right, or tr trim many in this case, five. And you, these are these are user uh, definable as well, okay? 
So that's just sort of one way if you want to perform that style of edit, you can do that pretty easily, okay? I don't I don't typically go into this anymore, maybe because the type of stuff that I'm doing doesn't generally require I don't know. I just don't use this view as much as I once did. I just don't. I'm not in fact, it's sort of interesting because I noticed this the other day myself. I was editing a video uh, one of my sons doing a lot of plush who who watches plush videos on YouTube? Maybe don't answer that if you're over 30, but you know, or do if you're over 30. Own it. I've watched some. They're actually pretty fun. Some of them are pretty darn creepy too. Um, I don't know. I just find like as I'm rippling and doing all this, I still have time code. I still see what I'm doing. So generally for me, this, just doing this and trimming this way, that's like enough. Again, it just really depends what you want to do, what you feel comfortable with, what works for you. All right. So that's the rolling edit tool. All right. And then we have the rate stretch tool. Now, technically we're going to cover more of this next week. What is the rate stretch tool? Well, it's a fancy way of saying it's a tool that allows you to adjust the speed of your clip without having to go into the speed parameters. That's it. So also known as time remapping, also known as slow down, speed up. So if I wanted to take this little gameplay piece right here, all right, only 230 points, not exactly rocking it. And I wanted to speed this whole thing up. Now it tells me the duration change in the tooltip there. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. I'm trying to drag over so you can see. It's telling me the duration change. So I'm going from, you know, 13 seconds, subtracting like eight seconds worth of duration They're down to five seconds. All right. Oh, that just went away. What just happened there? There we go. I don't know why that I don't know why that did that. Um, and if we play this back now, it's kind of hard to tell that it's I don't know, somebody's playing the piano. <laughs> it is faster. How can I verify that? Well, if I zoom in on the clip, you'll see that it shows me that it's playing back at 197% of its original speed. So this is effectively the same as if I were to right click on the clip and go into speed duration, right? And you can see there, we've now sped up the clip. So remember, it was originally 13 seconds, we're almost 200%. So it's now seven seconds and change. Okay. Now the difference is when you use the rate stretch tool, you don't have you, you you're not these these settings aren't revealed to you. So you're going to use whatever the default time interpolation method is, by the way, frame sampling, my least favorite, we're going to cover these next week. For my money, I think frame blending is the kind of the best overall for most things. Um, and optical flow can be extremely fluid and liquid. Like if you're really going for that super slow, you know, water drip, but you didn't shoot extremely high frame rate, optical flow can work great. It can also have diminishing returns depending upon the type of content. So you actually just need to try these. But the point is, if you use the rate stretch tool, it's just using whatever the default setting is already. Okay. So again, we're going to cover this next week in the advanced settings. But if you're just looking for a quick and dirty way to um, adjust the speed of a clip, and again, you can also stretch it out, make it longer and longer and longer. That's the way to do it. That's the way. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay just like that. And we put it back to normal there. Okay. That's the rate stretch tool. Now the last one here, we're not going to really cover that today. Uh, we'll revisit this later is the remix to oh, you can't see it. Sorry, my head's in the way is the remix tool. Actually, you know what? The heck with it. Let's, let's do that. Let's use the remix tool. We have we have a few more minutes. Hold on, I want to make sure. Uh, no, I'm gonna come back to it. The reason is it's audio only. So what does the remix tool do just very quickly because we've only got six minutes time flies on these streams. Similar concept to the rate stretch, except it's not stretching time. It's allowing you to maintain the same tempo, the same pitch of your music. It's not just going to squeeze it to fit. It's going to dynamically recompose, i.e. remix to fit a particular duration. So if you have a song that has a beginning, a middle and an end, it might cut off a few beats from the beginning and maybe eight bars from the middle and two bars from the end. 
and it'll make it fit into that new duration just by clicking and dragging. You don't have to edit, you don't have to cut, you don't have to transition, you don't have to do anything. It does it using AI and much like Content Aware Fill, it's one of those Adobe magic features. It can save you an enormous amount of time, particularly if you're not like great at audio editing. And it's it's just a it's a one click fix. It's awesome. We will revisit this. I invite you know invite you highly to check it out. It's great. Okay, a couple more tools we got to cover before we're out here because the one thing we didn't talk about is cutting. So we're doing a lot of trimming. We're trimming. We're rolling. We're rippling. What about just cutting something? All right. That of course is the razor tool. Shortcut key C. Right. So same thing here. And if your clips are linked you'll see that it is simultaneously applying cuts to audio and video, okay? Now again, another keyboard shortcut that I don't typically, uh, I don't typically, uh, or rather I do typically use, <laughs> what? Is when I make cuts, sometimes I like to move between the cuts. So I'm just holding down the shift key and using the down arrow to go forward and the up arrow to go backward. So this is going to allow me to scroll through the different cuts. All right. Also just in general edit points, right? So whether it's a cut or an edit, shift up arrow, down arrow allows me to do that. If I just do, you know, shift up arrow, down arrow, I can easily move between all of those. Okay. Um, that's, that's the razor tool as simple as that. By the way, let's say I razor this little middle bit right here. And I want to now take this out. Now you can lift. There's a lift function here. But I actually just want to ripple the whole thing. Now how would I use the ripple tool to do that? Well, you don't have to I can just right click control click on this clip. And I can choose to ripple delete. Okay. And as you will expect, <laughs> takes that piece out and everything moves over to the left magnetically, magnetic style. Okay. So very, very simple. Same thing here. Let's do it again. Let's make some cuts in here. All right. Like this little spin. I don't like that. Right click, ripple delete. Now play this back. All right. Looks like two completely different parts of the store because I took out that weird motion that I just had there. All right. Razor tool. You're going to use that all the time. Most common tools I use, razor, trim, ripple. Rolling, almost never. Here are two more that I use a lot though. So let's say I'm gonna try and find something good. It's not a lot of not a lot of action in a lot of these clips here. This one was particularly long. Let's do this. In fact, here I'm gonna, I'm gonna get rid of that. All right. Let's go down here to the slip tool. All right. Slip tool. We can't see it. Shortcut key Y on the US keyboard. This allows you to essentially change the viewable in and out of your clip without changing its uh, absolute duration, right? So you can see here, like if we go to the start point of this, this is where it's starting. But let's say I actually want the start point of this to be here. I want it to start there. It doesn't change the duration of that piece. It just starts later. I've slipped where the actual endpoint is. All right. You can go back to it. And I can say, ah, no, you know what? I, I prefer the, the, that one. Okay. Now we're back there. Slip. Easy. We also have in here the slide tool. Okay. And what this is going to do, this is a little different because this is actually moving the in and out points of adjacent clips. Okay. But again, maintaining the duration here. So as I slide, it's actually changing the out point of this clip here, right? And as I slide forward, same thing here. All right. So I almost never use this one. Again, this is more as you're kind of refining the edit. You might do a slip. You might do a slide. They are different. If you didn't click on that item there, you probably never see it. Check them out. They all have a lot of use. Okay. Last thing here. Talking about trim mode before. 
again, if we go into our is it in the uh, sequence menu? Yes, we're going to go into a trim edit mode, which is Shift T. This is a way that a lot of people like to edit. Again, this can this can vary sometimes in a loopable way. So maybe you want to advance an edit point again by a, a specific amount, x number of frames forward or back, and you kind of want to see what that looks like in context. You can hit the space bar, and it's just going to loop around that whole edit. And you can again continually in real time make changes and it will respect that as you're doing it and as it's looping the playback here. The default, I think, is something like three seconds for the pre-roll and post-roll, three and two. If you want to change that, so let's say you want a five second pre-roll, four second post-roll. If you go into preferences playback, here's where you can adjust. Oh, no, I was right, it's three and two. So there's a three second pre-roll, two second post-roll before it goes back into looping. So sometimes when you're doing an edit that's really critical, you know, maybe there's a voiceover underneath. We're doing all of this without audio. Um, this is a nice mode to be in. I think this works really well to get out of it. Again, we can just go back into trim edit. Now we're back to where we want it to be. But friends, that is all the time we have. So thank you so much. We've got the daily creative challenge coming up next. Thank you so much for joining. We will see you next week with advanced timeline editing tools and techniques. Until then, have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.